So, what do we have today? The answer to 1984 is 33 AD. Approximately. Oh, it's you again. Hi. Still sticking with that answer to 1984 thing. Did you ever elaborate on that? Am I missing something? Because quite frankly, I'm just not getting it. Whatever, that's not important. This is Tiger Dan. He's a nice guy. I made a video about him before, but he believes in a flat Earth and that the space station is a hoax. So since it's my atheist duty to dispute everything that I don't agree with, I'm making a video about it. Let's hear what he has to say. What I'm thinking is that the International Space Station is an anti-gravity device. The British Royal Air Force conceived the idea and built a workable levitating Harrier jet in the 1950s. What they're doing is purely the result of thrust vectoring. Basically, instead of force being applied backwards to thrust it forwards, force is applied downwards to thrust it upwards to counteract gravity. Michael Faraday was levitating heavy metals like this 165 years ago. Actually, he wasn't. In the limited research I could do, I see no indication that Faraday actually did anything with levitation. However, there is a form of levitation called electrodynamic suspension that deals a lot with Faraday's law. And Faraday's law is basically a prediction on how a magnetic field will interact with an electric circuit to produce an electromagnetic force. This is the only connection I could see to Faraday and levitation, and I see no indication that it was happening that early. But even if it did, that form of levitation wouldn't actually benefit you in any way if you were to levitate an entire space station, because the people inside the system would still be affected by gravity. So you'd need an entirely different form of levitation, which means that this doesn't aid in your argument at all. What we have on screen here is a micro-acoustic anti-gravity device. In physics, you've got something known as the Cater's Frequency, they knew about this over 200 years ago in the 1800s. If you get the sound frequency right, you can levitate particles like this and move them around. Okay, I haven't been able to find any information on this Cater's frequency, mostly because I don't know how to spell it. Anyways, it seems like it doesn't really matter because this form of levitation, which is acoustic levitation, doesn't actually deal with any specific frequency. There doesn't seem to be a limitation on the range of frequencies that you can use. You could even use ultrasonic frequencies, which means that you wouldn't have to hear it. Pay attention to the wobble in these micro-miniature transistors. I'll come back to that in a moment. These objects wobble because they're being held up by vibrations. Now this is going to be important. We'll come back to it in a minute. Look at the size of this device. It's tiny. You can put your hand in there. Now, if I could build this on a bigger scale, so if you could imagine the International Space Station being roughly this size in comparison to what would be the gigantic acoustic harmonic devices surrounding it, then the space station itself and all the astronauts inside would be levitating. Actually, no, it would have to be smaller than that, about the size of a really small nut. But I suppose it could be scaled up. They would only levitate the astronauts inside of it if the acoustic vibrations could pierce the outer shell of the station, which I don't know if it can. At this point, the critics will switch tactics and suddenly become the world's greatest experts in harmonics. In the comments below this video, they'll say, you can't build that any bigger because of the ooji booji element in the waveform that prevents it from being scaled up. Nonsense. Ha, joke's on you. I'm agreeing with you on this one. Maybe we could scale it up. Why not? But that's not the issue. So, back to the wobble. You can see the waveform that the acoustic device creates. It shows up under supercooled nitrogen. And I imagine that a human hair might wobble a bit under waveform conditions. So is this why the lady on screen has hold it firm hairspray on? I might be wrong, but this lady's hair appears to be moving inconsistently with what I'd expect from zero gravity. I'm not sure why you're saying this, because it seems to me that's exactly how it would behave in zero gravity. When she moves her head, her hair moves with it, with a slight delay, but that's not unexpected. 
I don't see any wobble in her hair, but even if I did, this wouldn't be explained by acoustic vibrations. See, if the entire space station was being held up by this acoustic levitation, then imagine that the entire space station itself was like those nodes that we saw earlier. The entire thing would be shaking violently, because it's literally being held up by vibrations. The station wouldn't be still, and only the hair on the people inside of it being vibrated. The vibrations affect the entire system. So, how on earth would I go about explaining away the International Space Station on the ground? You probably think it's an impossible task and can't be done. Why would I think that? What's to say that it's not possible? So how do you simulate weightlessness? Michael Faraday could levitate heavy copper like this in the 1850s. No, actually, he didn't. He wasn't really concerned at all with levitation. Anti-gravity devices come in lots of different forms. In its most simplistic form, you can see from the video here that if you pass a neodymium magnet through a copper tube, it becomes weightless. No, it doesn't. It passes through the tube. It falls. Turn the copper tube on its side, trapping the magnet in, and you've got complete weightlessness. If I had the budget, I'd experiment with neodymium weaved into the fabric of the clothing that the astronauts wear. But that would be obvious to the astronauts, because it wouldn't just be floating, they'd be held up by their own clothes, and their clothes would have to be able to fit tight around them. Not only that, but there's a lot of electric stuff going on around them, and I believe that magnets that strong would strongly interfere with all those computers laying around. Um, but I think that the acoustic design offers the best realistic example of a scaled up device that could defy gravity. Except for the fact that it would vibrate a lot, which is inconsistent with the videos that we see of the International Space Station. If the magnetic or harmonic devices didn't produce the best results, which they most certainly don't, then, as we can see here, they were experimenting with gimbal devices in the 1950s. Oh dear. Supermassive gimbal devices that somehow simulated a primitive form of horizontal weightlessness under the right spin conditions. What? No. You could clearly see in the video that that person is being held up by a harness and a wire. You can't simulate weightlessness by spinning. If you were to spin, you would feel the centrifugal force. And that obviously wouldn't be similar to the weightlessness in space. It's just an IMAX theater. 1.7 million people tuned in to watch this video about a 3,000 mile wide UFO caught over the Earth. Or is it just the bulb on the projector that's blown? Neither, actually. That particular image is a computer simulation of what would happen if a meteor struck the Earth, as part of the movie The Origins of Life. And you can go see this movie in the Planetario de Brasilia. It looks like that'll be it. Now Tiger Dan explains that he's not trying to say that this is factually what's going on. He even states that he doesn't have evidence, which I respect him for. So if any of you learn anything from this video, that should be to do your research. Goodbye. Uh... <laughs>